This is Wilson, a 4-bit TTL computer that I designed and built a couple of years ago. This footage is from my previous video, which received some really positive feedback, so thank you if you left a comment there. In this video, I hope to answer some questions that were raised by presenting a brief history of the project, an overview of its design, and what I'm planning to do next. I was first inspired to build my own computer over a decade ago, when I discovered the Magic One computer project. From here, I found the Homebrew CPU Ring, a web page indexing a wide range of hobbyist computers of all shapes and sizes. I realised computers were not boxes of proprietary magic, and decided that I wanted to have a go building my own. Though I had a lot of fun, my ambition outweighed my experience, and I never made any significant progress. Many years later, my interest was reignited by the success of the Gigatron computer. At the beginning of the pandemic, I decided to attempt designing a computer once again, and this would eventually result in Wilson. The project has three goals. The first is the creation of a standalone functional TTL computer supporting user input from a keyboard, a color video display, and the ability to load and store data or programs from an external source. Importantly, these features must be achieved without the help from microcontrollers or FPGAs. The second goal is to implement the computer with as little hardware as possible. The final goal is to implement a user interface reminiscent of early 1980s home computing. For example, a command line interface with a basic interpreter. Wilson is a breadboard computer built using 7400 series logic chips. These are a family of integrated circuits that were popular in the 1970s and 80s for providing compact logic and memory functions, a bit like digital Lego. The majority of the computer is built from these chips, with the remainder consisting of RAM, ROM, and a 555 timer. The design is based around a Harvard architecture, with a 4-bit data bus and a 17-bit address bus. This allows access to 128k words, or 64k bytes of RAM. It has four internal registers, eight output bits, and eight conditional branch modes shared between internal and external state. Program storage consists of 64K 16-bit words stored in two ROM chips. The computer is clocked to eight megahertz and executes one instruction per cycle. The construction of the computer began with the read-only program memory. It is addressed by a 16-bit program counter, which is illustrated here as two independent 8-bit registers, the program page and the sequencer. The former holds a fixed address that will later correspond to the jump instruction, and the latter is a counter that steps through each instruction in the current page. The outputs of the ROM are 12 control lines which orchestrate the rest of the machine and a 4-bit data word. After building this circuit, you can see data being loaded from ROM and being displayed on the LEDs. The next step was adding input and output to the computer. Inputs are selected by an 8 to 1 multiplexer, whose output is fed into the load enable of the sequencer. If the input is high, the upper nibble of the sequencer is set to the data word, and the lower nibble is reset to zero, giving rise to conditional branching. The program page remains unchanged. The computer outputs are controlled by an 8-bit addressable latch. A single bit can be addressed by the data word, and its state set or reset depending on the most significant bit on the data bus. These additions allow Wilson to execute its first program, blinking LED. The LED is connected to one of the outputs, whose state is continuously toggled. The program first sets the output high, then sets it low, then finally branches back to the beginning. At this point, the main control and input-output infrastructure of the computer was complete. The ability to read and write RAM was then added to the machine. This includes the addition of a 17-bit address bus, two 8-bit address registers, X and Y, the memory itself, and an 8-bit buffer register, A. The computer supports two addressing modes, indirect, using the values stored in X and Y, or direct, using the instruction data word. The least significant bit of the address bus is controlled by the current instruction, enabling access to either nibble of the address byte. As a result, Wilson can indirectly address 64 kilobytes, or directly address 16 bytes. 
all data is transferred across the central 4-bit data bus, and values are shifted into A, X, and Y 4 bits at a time. The A register is also connected to the input of the program page. In combination with the instruction data word, the computer can now unconditionally jump to one of 4096 addresses in program memory. To simplify the design, Wilson does not have a hardware ALU. Instead, arithmetic and logic operations are performed by looking up preloaded values in RAM. Two 4-bit arguments are loaded into X. The operation to be performed is loaded into Y, and the result can then be looked up and evaluated. Note that X is actually an 8-bit counter, which will be needed later on to quickly retrieve pixels when generating video. Wilson now has enough capability to operate as a general-purpose computer. To celebrate this, a second program was written to bit bang a byte over UART. The result? Wilson screaming eternally. Don't worry, I later modified the program to print a mandatory Hello World string instead. The final hardware problem to solve was the video display. Following in the Gigatron's footsteps, the original plan was to bit bang a standard 640 by 480 VGA signal. This resolution has a pixel clock of 25 MHz, which is clearly too fast for Wilson to generate. It can only push pixels at 8 MHz, which is over three times slower than the expected rate. Consequently, the scanline has pixels about three times wider than the standard resolution. To generate square pixels in the final image, the same scan line must be repeated another two times. In other words, the effective video output is approximately one third the resolution of standard VGA, at 203 by 160 pixels. Since Wilson can move four bits around at a time, it can support 16 colors per pixel. Late one evening, I connected our television up to the computer from across the room, crossed my fingers, and an image was displayed showing the uninitialized contents of RAM. With some further work, I got to outputting bitmap images instead, such as Hello World and some fish. This approach requires the computer to spend all of its time generating the video signal, leaving no time for anything else like executing programs. The Gigatron gets around this by utilizing the vertical blanking period and purposely skipping scan lines, but this requires a fair amount of maths to get the timings correct, and Wilson is terrible at maths. Instead, I decided to implement some very basic hardware acceleration. As before, Wilson generates scan lines by pushing pixels to the display, but now the pixels are also recorded into a buffer. Remember, Wilson produces a video output that is one third the standard VGA resolution, so each scan line needs to be repeated a total of three times. For the next two scan lines, the pixel data can be recalled from the buffer while the computer is doing something else. At the end of this period, Wilson resynchronizes with the buffer using the horizontal sync pulse, generates the next scan line, and then the process repeats indefinitely. I've glossed over a lot of detail here, but that is the basic principle behind the video display. The hardware design succeeds in providing just enough capability to support the features I want from the computer, while keeping the chip count as low as possible. A consequence of this is a substantial increase in software complexity. Recall that the computer can only load and store data from RAM, jump to different parts of the program ROM, and control eight single-bit outputs. Coupled with the strict timing requirements for the display and other peripherals, programming in Wilson assembly is time-consuming and quite challenging. After finalizing the hardware, most of the software effort has been towards developing an environment to abstract away this complexity. I call this the Wilson Runtime Environment, or REN and it aims to provide an 8-bit virtual instruction set similar to a 6502 CPU. All user code that runs on Wilson will need to be written in REN bytecode, or be executed in an interpreter that is itself written in REN. This is still very much a work in progress. To support the software development, I decided to write an emulator for Wilson. This was initially motivated by me being physically separated from the machine and wanting to work on it. This decision has proven incredibly valuable since I can operate and interrogate the emulator in ways that would otherwise be impossible with the real thing. The command line and pong demo in the first video were programmed in REN, developed inside the emulator, 
and were at first try on the physical hardware. Admittedly, the keyboard was a bit hit and miss, and I did mess up the colours somewhat. I hope this video has given a better idea into how Wilson works, even if I didn't go into huge amounts of detail. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to follow up on the original video. I've had a very limited amount of free time over the past two years, but I should now be able to dedicate a lot more time to the project than before. Looking forward, I've decided not to natively support an SD card, and instead only provide a serial port. It somehow feels more appropriate, and ultimately makes my life easier. I'm planning to add I2C, as well as support for extra RAM. In retrospect, I'm a bit disappointed that I did not prioritise audio earlier in the design, but maybe in the future I can figure something out. Finally, look what I've got! That's right, I've recently finished designing a PCB. I've no idea at this point if it will work or not, but I'll be making another video about it soon. Until then, thank you for watching.